This is chapter 6, part 2, and chapter 12, centripetal force and gravity. We're going to learn about the forces that cause objects to move in circular paths. And uh, one of those objects, as you know, um, would be a planet. Uh, although a planet's orbit is not perfectly circular, it's more elliptical. But satellites, um, they, have planet, they have orbits that are more circular. And we're going to learn uh, how gravity causes those orbits. We'll also learn what gravity is. Centripetal acceleration. Well, velocity is a vector. It has magnitude and direction. If either changes, the velocity vector changes. And that's acceleration. All right. Um, when you have a change in either magnitude or direction of velocity, uh, then you have a change in velocity, and that is acceleration. Acceleration is simply change in velocity over change in time, by definition. And what we have in circular motion at constant speed is we have the magnitude of velocity staying the same, but we have the direction constantly changing. So for example, if you're on a carousel like we see here pictured, if you're on a carousel and uh, let's pretend that you're just standing on the outer edge of the carousel, you're not even, um, you're not even going up and down on one of the animals, you're just standing, holding on to a bar. Well, if you go around and around, once the carousel gets going, you're just cruising along at constant speed. But what is constantly changing as you cruise along is the direction of your velocity. Your direction is constantly changing. And therefore, even though, though it doesn't feel like it, you are accelerating. No, you're not speeding up or slowing down. But you are accelerating because your velocity's direction is constantly changing. All right, so <clears throat> this is a little demo about circular motion, just to see uh, how it works and what centripetal force is. So here we have a battery-powered car, and if uh, I turn on the car, well, obviously it just wants to go straight. All right. and so by nature, it wants to go in a straight line, and I need to apply a force if I'm going to change that straight line. All right, And so that force is going to be supplied by this spring scale. And while watch what happens. Can you see what's happening? Even though the car wants to go straight, it's going in a circle. It's going in a circle because there's a force that's drawing it towards the center of the circle. Now we can also say that this uh, tumble buggy, this battery powered car, is uh, being accelerated towards the center. Now, notice that it's going at the same speed, so we're not talking about acceleration in the sense of speeding up or slowing down. We're talking about acceleration in the sense of the direction of velocity constantly changing. And at every moment, the direction of the velocity vector is constantly changing. Now, this car at any one moment has a velocity that we call tangential to the circle. In other words, the uh, path of the car would be on a line tangent to the circle at any moment. Now notice what happens if I suddenly let go of the force. Watch what the car does. Okay, so it's going in a circle, being held there by the tension in the spring, spring scale. Watch what happens if I suddenly release that force. Okay, here we go. It went in a tangent. All right. It went in a tangent when I released it. Now, a lot of times, people think that the car, if it's being swung around, is not going to go in a tangent line, but it's going to fly right off. Okay, our, tu our intuition is that as this thing is going around and around, if the tension is suddenly released, the car will fly off, opposite or away from the center. This is not the case. What happens is that it just goes in a tangent line, because that's where it would be going if it were not accelerated towards the center. Let's take one more look at that. Okay, going in the center. Now notice, I've got, um, I've got this Newton meter here. And so this Newton meter is going to measure, I'm just going to turn it around so I can see the force. It's going to measure the amount of force that it takes. And if I, if I keep my eyes on this, I can see that the amount of Newtons of centripetal force is about 0.6. So about 0.6 newtons of centripetal force 
is accelerating, accelerating the tumble buggy towards the center, making it go in a circle instead of in a straight line. Now, one more look, and keep in mind that the car will go off on a tangent to the circle and not away from the radius. Okay, I'm gonna let go. Here we go. I let go, and it went in a tangent. Notice that it's going in a tangent. And that is why we call the velocity of a circularly rotating object, we call that velocity tangential velocity. Centripetal acceleration, the abbreviation is A sub C. This kind of acceleration is always directed toward the center of rotation. And the um, equation for centripetal acceleration is A sub C equals uh, Vt squared over R. Vt, or V sub T, is simply the tangential velocity. Notice that if uh, you look at this diagram here on the right, pretend we have a red ball swinging around on a string. Well, the radius of that circular path is r, but at any one moment, like here we have uh, time 1 and time 2, uh, at any one moment, uh, the tangential velocity has the same magnitude, and if the string were cut, the ball would go flying off on that tangent. And so that's why we call it tangential velocity. But at every moment, even though the magnitude of the vt remains the same, the direction of vt is constantly changing. And therefore, it is proper to speak of this as acceleration, and we call it centripetal acceleration. This is the acceleration that keeps a, an object moving in a circular rather than in a straight line. So it moves along this circular path. We're going to derive the formula now for centripetal acceleration. We're going to refer to this diagram here. The mass in the drawing would move in the absence of any external forces from A to B in the time delta T. Okay, so pretend that, uh, pretend that this, uh, this ball is moving around in a circle and at point A the string gets cut. Well, that ball is going to want to go to point B okay because it's that's the tangential velocity however um, if we don't cut the string the ball is going to end up at point C it's going to continue along the circular path so we notice there's a difference instead of ending up at B it ends up at C in that time interval Delta T the difference is that it has also fallen through the distance D so here we have the distance D which is between point B and point C the combination of straight line motion and inward motion is such that the mass follows the circular path. So we have both kinds of motion happening at the same time, tangential and inward, and they interact or combine to form uh, a circular path. The inward motion is due to a center-directed constant force, which causes an acceleration toward the center. Now this force, by the way, is called centripetal force. We'll talk more about it later. In the example of a mass being whirled around at the end of a string, or the tumble buggy we saw earlier, the tension in the string uh, provides the force. The acceleration value is exactly such that the whirling object stays on the circle. All right, as a preliminary step in our proof, we will need a little formula for the distance d in the drawing below. Now look at the drawing here. What we have is we have something similar to the diagram on the last screen. But here we're labeling the straight line distance s, and we're labeling um, the distance it falls towards the center as d, that stays the same. And we've clarified that this is r just as, um, just as the central line is r. And we have an, an angle theta, which for our purposes, purposes we're going to um, treat as small. The, the formula and the derivation that we're going to be doing is valid for small angles and anyway that's what interests us because what we're dealing with are minute moment-to-moment -moment changes in direction. The formula will apply only when the angle theta is very small. In the drawing we have a right triangle whose hypotenuse is longer than r by the amount d so that by the Pythagorean theorem we have r squared plus s squared equals r plus d squared. Now look at this right triangle and you'll see why that's true. One leg is r, the other leg is s, and the hypotenuse is r plus d.
Now continuing our proof, we have r squared plus s squared equals r squared plus 2rd plus d squared. That simplifies to s squared equals 2rd plus d squared. And finally, rearranging terms to get d by itself, we can, we can write it as s squared over 2r minus d squared over 2r equals d. Now, all we did there is just subtracted uh, d squared from each side, and then we divided each side by 2r. Okay, carrying forward, we have the diagram, and I didn't change anything. The only thing I did here is just um, inverted the order of the equation. It's really the same. Uh, it's just now we're writing it as d equals s squared over 2r minus d squared over 2r. Now, here is, herein lies the essence of the proof. If theta is small, then d is small. If d is small, then d squared is very small, and we can ignore the second term on the right. All right, let's uh, take a minute to examine that. If I'm looking at this theta here, and I pretend that theta is teeny, teeny, tiny, obviously we have a bigger theta here just so we can visualize, but if it were teeny, teeny, tiny, I'd be talking about um, an r that goes right, right up here. Okay. Now, let's just, for the sake of clarity, uh, mark out that. And let's pretend that we have a really teeny tiny angle, and it just kind of goes right up here. And um, obviously it's not as straight as I'd like it to be, but you get the point. So if that were the angle, and that red line were the radius there, you can see how d, that distance, is so tiny that you can't even see it on this diagram. All right, so if d is small, then d squared is very small. Um, you know, if you have a fraction like one-half and you square it, you get one-fourth, that's smaller. Or if you have one-fourth and you square that, you get one-sixteenth, which is even smaller. So when you're squaring um, fractions or decimals, you end up with something even smaller. And that's why if d is tiny, then d squared is even tinier. So what does that do for us? Well, if you look up at this term here, and I'm going to circle it in red, this term here is d squared over 2r. And if d squared is so tiny, and we're dividing that tiny thing by a relatively big number, which is 2r. Well, then we're going to get something so close to zero that we can disregard it. And so this is what we end up with. The limit of d as theta approaches zero equals s squared over 2r. Now, don't worry about this, uh, this terminology of lim. That's something that you'll see more in calculus. But for now, just for the proof, Suffice it to say that d squared over 2r becomes um, so small as to be considered insignificant. And so we can ignore it for small values of theta. And we're left with d equals s squared over 2r. Now the diagram at right shows what happens in a time period delta t. The straight line distance s is vt delta t. And the mass has also fallen toward the center by the distance d. All right, so this vt delta t, vt is just the tangential velocity. And so like if we cut that string, as I said earlier, and the ball went flying off in a straight line, well, it would fly off with a velocity of magnitude vt. And then if you multiply that velocity by the delta t, you end up with a distance s. And so s is really just equal to vt delta t. Remember that when um, you're do, doing speed problems, if you have a speed like, I don't know, 20 miles per hour, and you have a time like one hour, well, 20 miles per hour times one hour is 20 miles. Okay, so that's all we did here. Vt delta t is a distance s. And we came up with an expression for d, which is d equals s squared over 2r. And since d equals s squared over 2r, we replace s with vt delta t, and we have d equals vt delta t squared over 2r. All right, so that's the first part of the proof. To arrive at this expression, d equals vt delta t squared over 2r. Now, one of our five formulas of constant acceleration that we learned in chapter 3 gives us another expression for d. So I can write it this way. d equals the uh, displacement along the centripetal uh, axis or along the radius, so I have it as s sub c, equals vic delta t plus one-half ac delta t squared. So you can see that this is just the equation for uh, s equals vit plus one-half at squared. We simply wrote it 
with different symbols to match the, uh, the situation we're dealing with. And so this is an alternate expression for D that is completely valid as well. Um, this would be the distance uh, that the, the ball falls towards the center in time t. Now, this vic delta t will disappear because it has an initial velocity towards the center of zero. Now I'm going to go back to our little drawing here and, uh, and tell you what I mean by that. We're going to zero in on this section here. And notice, if you zero in here, that this d okay, shows where it ends up on the circle. And um, the point right up here shows where it would end up if it weren't on a circle. Okay, so that's, that's like falling through a distance. And so if you consider this a fall that I'm tracing now, well, the initial velocity towards the center is zero, and it ends up with a certain velocity at the end. Okay, remember that we're kind of separating the two motions, one's linear and one's towards the center. We're setting, se separating them and treating them uh, independently in order to derive the formula. And so we have d equals one-half ac delta t squared, simplifying since v vic is zero. And now we can set the two expressions equal. On the last screen, we found that d equals vt delta t squared over 2r. Now we're going to set that equal to what we just uh, derived, which is 1 half ac delta t squared. And doing the math and um, finishing the algebra steps, we have uh, vt squared over r equals ac. And that is, that is the formula for centripetal acceleration. The centripetal acceleration, a sub c, equals the tangential velocity squared divided by the radius. Now, that whole derivation we just did, I'm never going to test you on that. Um, you'll never get tested on derivations. And yet, they are important to include because um, you don't want to just be learning formulas mindlessly. You want to you want to learn where they come from. Now, you might not want to as like, you know, our typical way of understanding want, but you want to in the sense that it's, it's really best for you uh, to see where formulas come from. All right, now that we've done that derivation, you don't have to worry about it anymore, but do remember the formula AC equals VT squared over R. Now, circular motion, where there is acceleration, there is force. We know that from Newton's second law, F equals MA. And so an object moving in a circle is constantly accelerating. And we can see that here in the diagram because the, the ball has um, V1, which is a certain direction. And then over here in position two, the ball has V2, which is a different direction. So acceleration has happened. And if acceleration has happened, well, there must have been a force acting. Otherwise, the ball would have moved in a straight line. So the direction of this force is towards the center of the circle just as the direction of the acceleration is towards the center of the circle. Now this force, which we're going to call centripetal force, may be provided by the tension in the string or static friction, for example. So if we see this guy here on the left whirling a ball over his head, well, um, the, the force that is keeping this ball going in a circle is the tension in this string. If you cut the string, the ball would fly off on a tangent. Let's look at um, this image here on the right. We have a car. This time it's not a banked turn, it's just a flat turn. Um, but there is a force that's keeping the car moving in a circle and keeping it from going off uh, on a tangent, and that is the force of static friction. Now remember, since the wheels are rolling and not skidding, but at every moment the tires are in contact with the road, that's, we're, that's static friction. If the wheels were skidding, we'd be, we'd be talking about kinetic friction, but they're not skidding, all right? And so it's important to remember that this is static friction, which is keeping this car on its circular path. Now, centripetal force, formally defined, F sub C equals MAC equals MVT squared over R. There's no need for a derivation here, because this left side is just Newton's second law, F equals MA. And this states that the centripetal force equals the mass times the centripetal acceleration. 
And then on the right side, we simply replace AC with what we've already derived, and we have mvt squared over r. So going back to our ball on a string example, since it's uh, easy to visualize, we have this ball on a string, and we have the radius of the circular path. We have um, v, and that is the tangential velocity. And um, we can write the centripetal force as mvt squared over r. Now notice that there is um, centripetal force is just directed towards the center. All right, the the tension in the rope extends away from my hand, but it also extends from the ball in towards my hand because that's how tension is. Tension is on all sides, so we would call that a reaction force. Now sometimes that reaction force is is called by their names, like you've probably heard of centrifugal force. Well, centrifugal force is really just a reaction to centripetal force. It doesn't, um, it's not an independent force. What matters is the centripetal force. Anything else is just a reaction to that. Okay, um, and so what we have is we have a reaction force that is uh, equal in magnitude and opposite. And of course, m is the mass of the ball. All right, so this is just an illustration of the centripetal force formula. Let's look at this problem. A fast pitch softball player does a windmill pitch, moving her hand through a vertical circular arc to pitch a ball at 75.0 miles per hour. The 0 0.190 kilogram ball is 52.0 centimeters from the pivot point at her shoulder. Just before the ball leaves her hand, what is its centripetal force? All right, before you get into the calculation, let's take a minute to look at this animation of a softball pitcher doing a windmill pitch. Okay, so we see she starts at the left, goes up, winds up, and then she does this nice circular motion. Watch it again. Circular motion with her arm and then releases at the bottom. Now, the reason I left this green arrow here is because this green arrow pinpoints the exact, uh, the exact point of release of that softball, the moment where her hand lets go of the softball. And, and this is actually like, um, it's a proof in the observation of what I've been saying all along regarding tangential velocity. Okay, if the velocity were not tangential, then at the moment of release, when her hand is at its lowest point, well, the ball would go straight into the ground because that's where the that's where you'd think you might uh, guess the velocity was directed but notice that it doesn't go into the ground it goes horizontally and it goes horizontally because the ball wants to go on a path tangential to the circle her arm moves in a circle lets go of the softball at the bottom and when it does the ball flies off in a tangent Okay, so um, what we have here then is a chance to use the new formulas we learned. Pause the video, do that on your own, and resume when you have your answer. Okay, so going through the solution, first we have to, of course, convert 75 miles per hour to meters per second. And I won't show the steps for that because that, you know, we already went over unit conversions. But you should have ended up with 33.521 meters per second. And... Um, that's just, you know, uh, keeping in mind that a mile is 1,609 meters and an hour is 3,600 seconds. Then we have A sub C equals VT squared over R. And then we just do our um, plugging and chugging and end up with uh, 2,160.88 meters per second squared. That's a um, very high acceleration when you think about it. And now we just do our... Um, FC equals MAC, and when we put in our values there, we end up with 411 newtons. That's the centripetal force on the ball. In other words, this is the force on the ball that's directed towards the center of the circle, and at the moment of release, the ball flies off in a tangent. The next big topic is gravity. And gravity is all around us. Um, you may have even seen the movie Gravity, um, which is pretty good, by the way. And these people are floating around, and that becomes dangerous because if not for the tether, you could float off uh, eternally and never come back.
and unfortunately that's what happened to one of the guys in the film. But in any case, um, gravity is all around us. We uh, experience it every day. Gravity is what is keeping you in your chair right now. Um, gravity is what you know makes things fall when you drop them. So gravity is all around us. Today we're going to learn about uh, what gravity really is. Now we're going to talk about Newton's law of universal gravitation. So Newton had an insight. The force accelerating an apple downward is the same force that keeps the moon in its orbit. Of course, you know, the, the famous anecdote about this is that Newton first started thinking about it when he was sitting under an apple tree and an apple uh, fell down and struck him on the head. <laughs> so it got him thinking that the uh, force uh, that accelerated that apple onto his head uh, was the same as that force that keeps the moon in its orbit. And he was, he was completely right. It was an amazing insight that was later proven. So Newton came up with this equation. He didn't write it exactly like this, but this is basically um, what, what he meant. All right? F equals g m1 m2 over r squared. All right, now <clears throat> this is an extremely important uh, equation. G, uh, F equals g m1 m2 over r squared. And um, we're going to talk more about it and, and, and you know try to understand it better. But for now, let's try to kind of um, figure out what Newton was trying to say. If we look at F equals g m1 m2 over r squared, well, we can see a couple things right off the bat. Uh, F is force, okay? m1 is one mass, m2 is the other mass, if we're talking about two, uh, two objects. And r, which stands for radius, is really just the distance between the two objects. So what this means, just qualitatively, without you know, going into calculations, is that if the masses are big, you'll have a big force of gravity. If the masses are small, you'll have a small force of gravity. If the distance between the masses is small, you'll have a big force of gravity. If the distance between the masses is big, you'll have a small force of gravity. All right, so um, in other words, we could say that the force of gravity varies directly as the magnitude of the two masses and inversely as the square of the distance between the two masses. Now, this big G here is a constant and the most fascinating thing about big G is that big G is the same in any part of the universe. Um, this, is, this is one of the most fundamental constants that we have in physics. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Now, when you're memorizing G, you don't have to worry about the units. The units uh, are really just there because you know uh, that allows uh, the other units to cancel and end up you end up with just newtons. You can prove that to yourself later. I don't want you to worry about it. But 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th is something you should memorize because this is a fundamental constant in physics, and it's one that's true in any part of the universe. It's the constant of proportionality, and this constant of proportionality. Um, is the same no matter how big the masses are or how far they are apart. Um, it's always true. And so big G is this uh, constant or the universal gravitation constant. Now when Newton first wrote this equation he didn't write it with big G. He wrote it with a symbol showing uh, proportionality because his insight was that the force was uh, directly proportional to the masses and inversely to the distance. But he didn't calculate g. Someone else did that, as we're going to find out later. Now, the gravitational force is always attractive and points along the line connecting the two masses. So let's suppose we have a mass m1, and let's suppose we have a mass m2. Well, m1 is attracted to m2, and m2 is attracted to m1. This is a mutual attraction. That sounds almost romantic, I guess, you know, a mutual attraction, but that's what we have with gravity. We have a mutual attraction. M1 is attracted to M2, and M2 is attracted to M1, and they exert this attractive force on each other. 
So the two forces shown are an action-reaction pair. Um, and uh, as you know, as you remember, Newton's third law tells us that for every action force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. Now going back to um, the, the formula for gravity, this, this fundamental equation, uh, if we have a big M1 and a big M2, then we'll have a big F. All right, but if we have a small r, in other words, if these masses M1 and M2 are close to each other, small r, we're going to have a big F. And if we have a big r, that is, these two are far apart from each other, we'll have a small f. Now, big G is a very small number. This means that the force of gravity is negligible unless there is a very large mass involved, such as the Earth. So our common experience is we feel gravity all the time. And uh, we feel gravity strongly, especially if we jump in the air um, or drop something. And that's because um, the mass of the Earth, especially in comparison to us, is, is gigantic. And so we do feel gravity. However, when you're talking about small masses, they exert a pretty small force on each other. For example, your body's mass is attracted to the mass of your neighbor's refrigerator. But the force of attraction is too small to perceive. And so at any particular moment, your body is being pulled in all kinds of directions. It's being pulled down towards the Earth, that you feel. But it's also being pulled towards uh, your neighbor's house. It's being pulled towards someone else who's in your house, being pulled towards the screen in front of you. Um, it's being pulled towards any number of other masses that surround you. And yet, because those forces are so tiny, you don't notice them. Now, it's kind of funny how, um, if you think about it, we're talking about this uh, attractive force. And uh, that means that, you know, you are attracted to everyone else, and everyone else is attracted to you. And so, uh, you know, that means that no one in the world is unattractive, because everyone in the world is uh, attracting someone, and everyone else in the world is being attracted by that person. All right, because uh, we all exert some kind of force of gravity on everyone else. Now, <clears throat> the only way that we notice this, or the only times that we notice this, is if, uh, if the masses involved are large. Gravitational attraction of spherical bodies. Gravitational force between a point mass and a sphere. The force is the same as if all the mass of the sphere were concentrated at its center. So let's pretend that we have this uh, gigantic uh, bowling ball and we have next to it a golf ball. And pretend that the bowling ball is very dense, weighs millions of pounds, and the golf ball is very dense, it weighs thousands of pounds. And um, there will be a mutual force of attraction between big M and little m. But this force of attraction is um, is concentrated, as it were, at the center of big M. Now, in reality, since um, M is, is, is large, well, there are different parts of M that are attracted in different ways to little m. For example, if we look at point A, well, point A is going to feel a little bit more of an attractive force um, than point C or point B or point D, because point A is closer to uh, to little m. However, if you take all of that into consideration, it ends up being the same as if all the mass were concentrated at the center of the large bowling ball. And so for all practical purposes when we're doing gravity problems, we can just do, um, we can just do the lines of force from center to center, and we don't have to worry about the size or shape of the object. Henry Cavendish 1731 to 1810, was a British scientist. And um, Cavendish was a fascinating person. Um, one thing you should know about Cavendish is he was extremely shy, extremely shy, painfully shy. He didn't want to talk to anybody. Uh, he hardly ever spoke to men. And, and never, never, if he could help it, spoke to women. In fact, he, uh, he was quite a wealthy man, especially because of his accomplishments in, in science. He was uh, very well respected and well known. 
uh, in his own time, even before he died. So he was wealthy and he had these female servants uh, taking care of the house and stuff, but he never even talked to them. He would uh, communicate with them with notes, only written notes. He couldn't stand talking to women and could hardly stand talking to anybody. Well, anyway, uh, that aspect of his personality aside, he was a great scientist. And part of the, the interesting thing about him, precisely because he was so shy, is he didn't talk much about his work. And uh, later on, um, when, when the scientist Maxwell was looking through his papers years after Cavendish's death, he found that Cavendish had discovered many other things that other scientists had been given credit for, but that Cavendish had never bothered to publish or was too shy to publish. However, the one thing he's most famous for is what I'm about to explain to you, and that is the Cavendish experiment. He did it in 1798, and it measured the universal gravitation constant. Now, keep in mind that Cavendish already knew um, what uh, Newton had, had come up with about the equation and the dependence of the force of gravity on the size of the masses and on the, um, and on the distance between the masses. But what Cavendish set out to find was the exact value of big G, of this universal gravitation constant. And here's how he did it. He set up um, he set up these spherical masses, and they were actually quite heavy. Um, the big M's were uh, over 200 pounds, and the small M's were not much less than that, about 50 pounds or so. And he was able to, with this device, and this was a six-foot rod that he had, so he had the little M's separated by a six-foot rod, and um, what he did is he had them start at this position. Notice we have this kind of ghost position here that I'm outlining now with the mouse arrow. And this ghost position here um, shows where it started. Of course, the distance has been exaggerated. And we see that the rod has been rotated because these masses are exerting a mutual attractive force on each other due to gravity. Now Cavendish knew, to, knew that the uh, masses would be attracted to each other, but what was ingenious is his way of measuring the amount of attraction. So he had a mirror hanging and he had a light source shining on the mirror. And this uh, mirror was hanging um, by something that had a known torsion coefficient. In other words, that's just uh, how much force it takes to twist something. So he could calculate by how much the rod twisted, he could calculate knowing um, the torsion coefficient could calculate through the angle of rotation how much force was exerted by uh, little m on big M and big M on little m. Okay, so by measuring theta and doing other calculations, he could calculate big G or the universal gravitation constant. Um, the ingenious thing about his experiment is that he he sealed it off from the air. He put he put this experiment in his own little backyard shed, and he didn't even observe it with the naked eye because he knew that his own breath would throw off the results, so he, he wanted to free it from air currents. He observed everything through holes in the little shed that he made. So, fascinating guy, this Cavendish, and what he came up with has um, been immortalized and still bears his name. He was the first one to calculate big G. Now here's the link between big G and little g. All right, we know that uh, the force of gravity equals g m m e over r e squared. Now, what do these symbols stand for? Well, let me explain that. m e is just the mass of the Earth. m is some mass that's on the Earth's surface or close to it. Big G is the universal gravitation constant. And r e, or r sub e, is the radius of the Earth. And so the link between the two is that, well, gravity this force of gravity is what is causing something to feel heavy and we already have our equation for weight which is mg and so since um, since they are equivalent since mg is weight and weights caused by gravity it must be equivalent to this force and that equation is given to us the gravitational equation when we set them equal to each other we see something fascinating the little m's cancel notice that we have little m on the right little m on the left, those cancel, and we're left with big G times the mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth squared equals G, the 
gravitational acceleration constant that we've been using. All right, so this is a fascinating um, consequence of gravity and Newton's equation and then Cavendish's experiment. So here's what Cavendish did with this. He saw that these were equivalent and he used it to figure out the mass of the Earth. Here's how he did it. He knew g. g was already known, had been measured, and of course g depends on where you are on the Earth, but we can we can use good estimates for it, about 9.8 or so. And then he didn't know big G, um, but he found big G by doing the Cavendish experiment and was able to come up with a, a value close to what we now have of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. He was a little off, but he was close. And he knew the radius of the Earth. That had been, um, well, it had been estimated uh, because people knew the circumference of the Earth, and so they were able to figure out the radius. And with that, with all of those givens, he was able to figure out uh, m sub e. And m sub e was the mass of the Earth. Cavendish was the first one to figure out the mass of the Earth. That's pretty cool. Incidentally, this is a mathematical proof for the fact that all masses near the surface of a planet fall at exactly the same rate. The constant g is independent of the falling object's mass, and our mathematical proof for that is that the little m's cancel. All right, the little m's cancel. So since the little m's cancel, we can see that the magnitude of little m doesn't matter. Um, this uh, little g is going to be the same no matter what the magnitude of little m is. And uh, we see this verified in experiment when we um, put two objects of different masses in a vacuum and watch them fall with a high-speed camera. We see that they fall at exactly the same rate. Tides. Usually we can treat planets, moons, and stars as though they were point objects, but in fact they are not. When two large objects exert gravitational forces on each other, the force on the near side is larger than the force on the far side, because the near side is closer to the other object. This difference in gravitational force across an object, due to its size, is called a tidal force. Now here's a diagram to illustrate tidal forces. The figure on the left illustrates a general tidal force, and the one on the right shows um, specifically what tidal forces do to the Earth. Now here's the fascinating thing. If you look at this diagram on the left, notice what we have here. We have a force vector from the center with a certain magnitude. Then we have another force vector from the surface closest to the center of the path, and that, um, that is larger because it's closer, and so gravity is forcer when objects are, uh, the gravity is uh, stronger when objects are closer. And then we also have this vector over here that's on the far side of the sphere, and that's the smallest of the three because this is the point that's farthest from the other mass. Now, if you want to think of it this way, think of it as the whole thing being squeezed. For example, if you have a tether ball and you hit that tether ball, well, if you were to zoom in on the tether ball, you'd see that it, were, it was slightly elongated. Um, and that's because part of it is closer to the tension than the rest. And the part that's far away from the point of string is being squeezed out. And so this is kind of similar to what happens with the Earth and the tides. All right, if we look at, um, if, we, if we think of the moon as being one mass, okay, and the Earth as being another, well, we can see that one side of the Earth is going to be closer to the moon than the other side. The effect on the Earth is that it squashes it a little bit, and um, when, when it squashes it, it causes a high tide on either end and a low tide at the top and bottom. Now, since the Earth itself is rotating, that high tide shifts and the low tide shifts. Um, but the cool thing about this is that uh, this is called the tidal force, and it's the result of the fact that the moon is always closer to one side of the Earth than it is to the other side. And yet, because of the resulting deformation of the Earth, we have a high tide on both sides of the Earth, the close side and the far side. And we have low tides uh, at the poles. Now, obviously, the Earth is tilted, and so you're still going to get low tides and high tides near the poles um, because of that tilt. But this uh, is just an exaggerated diagram to help us understand tidal forces. Now, there are other ways to understand it as well. Uh, the tetherball example 
is just something that we can visualize. And I can talk about that more in class if you're interested. But this is the reason why we have two high tides and two low tides a day. You unlock this. Well, here on Earth, it turns out that we always see exactly the same features on the Moon's surface. That's because the Moon spins once around its axis in the same amount of time it takes to go all the way around the Earth, about four weeks. So the same side of the Moon is always facing us. What we see as changes, or phases of the Moon, are actually changes in the Moon's illumination as seen from Earth. This lunar cycle starts with the new moon, when the moon is in the same direction as the sun. The side of the moon facing the earth is dark and is lost to the sun's glare. At first quarter the moon has moved one quarter of the way around its orbit. At this point it is at right angles to the sun and we see it half lit. About a week later, when the moon is full, it's opposite the sun in the sky, rising just as the sun sets. Its face is now fully illuminated. The moon reaches the third quarter of its orbit in yet another week. From here, the moon wanes to a crescent and will become new again, starting the cycle all over. Since the moon is so far away, it always looks the same to everyone on Earth who can see it. It's located in different places in the sky depending on where you happen to be. But its appearance is constant. Interestingly, if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, the Moon looks to be upside down compared to its appearance from the Northern Hemisphere. So even though the Moon seems to be changing all the time, it really is just a trick of the light. Let's do this problem. Assume that you have a mass of 50.0 kilograms. Earth has a mass of 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms and a radius of 6.38 times 10 to the 6th meters. What is the force of gravitational attraction between you and Earth? So here, obviously, uh, we have an exaggerated drawing. Um, but this is how the vectors would look. We got the yellow vectors. Um, and if you're standing on the Earth, this is, this is really what's happening. Okay? Um, you, are being, you are being pushed downward, or pulled downward, rather, because you're pulled by the attractive force of gravity that the Earth exerts. But, even though this is hard to believe, and definitely can't be measured, the Earth is just a little bit attracted to you as well. Uh, gravity is always mutual, okay? And so, if you're standing on the planet, yes, you're being pulled towards the center of the planet, but the center of the planet is also being pulled ever so slightly and imperceptibly to you, okay? Um, now, of course, there's no way to measure that pull, but keeping in mind um, the nature of gravity, we know that this must be true because gravity is a mutually attractive force. So here's the solution. We're going to do our layout. M1 would be the Earth. M2 is you. The radius of the Earth is given, and we're trying to find the force. So we use our equation F equals G M1 M2 over R squared. And then the rest is just uh, plugging and chugging, and we get 489 newtons. Now, a quick note about the plugging and chugging. There's a fast way to do it and a slow way. The fastest way is just to put this all in your calculator, all in a row, and don't do different steps and ants and all that kind of stuff. Now, I can go over this more in class, but uh, for now, suffice to say that you can just put 6.67 times 10 and negative 11 in, multiply that whole thing by 5.97 times 10 to the 24th, multiply that whole thing by 50.0, and in the same line, without even changing lines on your calculator, do divided by 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters squared. Just remember that you need to put parentheses in the appropriate places. If you do that in one fell swoop, you'll end up with your answer of 489 newtons. Now, try the same problem using FW equals mg instead. So we want to find that force of gravity, but this time we're just going to use mg. Well, if we do that, fw equals 50.0 times 9.81, and we end up with 490.5 newtons. It's so close. It's so close to 489, and that's because 
um, big G times the mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth squared equals little g. Now you might ask, well, what's the reason for the discrepancy? Uh, y is over here 4089 and over here 490.5. Well, there are several reasons for that. Um, one reason is that g, uh, g varies widely depending on where on the planet you are. Uh, g is a little less towards the equator, a little more far from the equator. Also, the, the value they gave us for the mass of the Earth is approximate, and so is the value they gave us for the radius of the Earth. These are approximations. And that explains the slight discrepancy between 489 and 490.5. And yet, those numbers are still very close to each other. Uh, and that's because um, the force of gravity really is the source of mg. It's the source of that formula mg. And it's, um, it's the physical reason for it. Now, gravitational attraction of spherical bodies is interesting because the acceleration of gravity decreases slowly with altitude. And um, if you think about it, it makes sense. Like, for example, if you were to, if you were to stand on top of a 10-story building and drop a baseball, well, it would drop at pretty much the same exact speed as, he, as if you were to drop that from uh, a plane. And that's because, that's because in relation to the radius of the Earth, the distance between the falling object and the surface of the Earth is almost insignificant. Now, there is, uh, there is that correlation, though, when you're dealing with objects that are fairly close to Earth, you know, like the space shuttle, for example, 150 miles away from the surface of the Earth. 150 miles is still, um, it's still not that much in relation to the Earth's radius. Um, and that's why, that's why this number, this purple line here, is a little bit lower than at sea level, uh, but it's not that much lower. It's not that much lower. Mount, Mount Everest over here, which is, you know, five miles up, as so we can see, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, so about five miles up. Mount Everest, if you're at the very top of Mount Everest and you drop something uh, 10 feet, it's going to fall at about the same rate, very close to the same rate, as if you were at sea level and did the same thing. All right, so the point is that when you're dealing with things that are fairly close to Earth's surface, within 200 miles or so, uh, even though the acceleration of gravity decreases a little bit, it's not that much. However, once the altitude becomes comparable to the radius of the Earth, the decrease in the acceleration of gravity is much larger. Okay, and so now if you look at this uh, x-axis, now we're dealing with some serious distances. 5,000 miles, 10,000 miles, 15,000 miles, 20,000 miles. That is pretty far from the surface of the Earth. And that's significantly close uh, or comparable to the radius of the Earth, and that's why the force of gravity falls off so much. Remember that, um, remember that we have g times m1 times m2 over r squared. And so it varies inversely as the square of the distance. So when you get really far away, the, uh, the strength of gravity drops off quickly, as we can see here, as we can see here. And then, of course, when you get even farther away, like at 20,000, well, then it kind of tapers off and we have this really weak force of gravity, but it doesn't change too much uh, with distance at that point. The real big change happens, uh, you know, as you can see here, from about, uh, from about two, 200 miles to about 5,000 miles, about 200 miles to 5,000 miles, that's a big change. Okay, and we have a huge decrease in gravity. Now with the satellite, which is over 20,000 miles up, there's still enough gravity to keep the satellite in orbit and uh, and yet it's not enough to suck the satellite all the way back into Earth, Earth's atmosphere. Let's do this problem. A satellite orbits the Earth in a circular motion. The radius of the Earth is 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters and the satellite's altitude is 35,786 kilometers. If the mass of the Earth is 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms and the mass of the satellite is 500 kilograms, what is the satellite's tangential velocity? All right, I'm going to give you a couple of pointers before you start, so don't pause yet. Let's uh, look at the diagram. We have the mass of the Earth, big M sub E. That's here in the middle. We've got the distance uh, marked as from the center of the satellite to the center of the Earth, and that's our distance R.
we have a force vector, the centripetal force. We have this green v sub t, which is the tangential velocity, and we have m, the mass of the satellite. Now, you need to keep in mind that in an orbit, the centripetal force, fc, is fg. In other words, let's look at this diagram. Okay, in this diagram, we don't have a ball swinging around on a string with a string providing the, uh, the tension and the centripetal force. No, here we don't have any contact, physical contact, between the satellite and Earth, but what we do have, what we do have, is the force of gravity that's keeping this satellite on a circular orbit rather than um, letting it go in a straight line. Now, in reality, um, uh, satellite orbits aren't perfectly circular, I'll, but I'll explain that later, and don't worry about that for now. For now, just think of it as a circle. And um, what we have here is the centripetal force being provided by gravity. And so the centripetal force is the force of gravity. Therefore, you're going to be using this equation in your solution. mvt squared over r equals g m e m over r squared. So pause the video, do the rest on your own, and resume when you have your answer. All right, so the solution, we do our layout, write down our givens. Notice that we had to add the radius of the Earth to the altitude. And that's important because this altitude is significant and is, uh, is comparable or not, not too small in comparison with the radius of the Earth. And that's why we have to add it in. And that's going to give our overall radius or the overall distance between the two. Now, going back to the diagram, just a quick explanation on that. The radius of the Earth takes up this portion of, uh, of R, which I'm uh, circling now with the mouse arrow. That portion of R would be the radius of the Earth, but then you have to add it to the portion of R, which is the altitude of the satellite above the surface of the Earth. Okay, going back, we have VT is a question mark. And now, using the equation MVT squared over R, which is centripetal force, equals g m e m over r squared, which is gravity, we can now solve for vt. We do our, uh, our plugging and chugging, and we end up with vt equals 3.0 kilometers per second. 3.0 kilometers per second. Of course, you could have expressed your answer in meters per second, and that would have been fine. But we have 3.07 kilometers per second, and if you think about it, that's extremely fast. That's extremely fast. A whole three kilometers in one second? Wow! Um, that's how fast satellites are zipping around the Earth way above uh, our, our atmosphere. All right, one last thing to explain. Kepler's laws of orbital motion. All right, so um, Kepler's laws of orbital motion, it, it says that we have um, not circular orbits, but elliptical orbits. Johannes Kepler made detailed studies of the apparent motions of the planets over many years and observed that planets and comets follow elliptical orbits with the Sun at one focus of the ellipse. Now, we're not going to get into all the math of ellipses uh, right now because, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, series of equations about uh, ellipses and their foci and all that if you've ever taken conic sections in, in math. But uh, what I'd like to kind of just uh, highlight now is is the concept. All right, you might ask, well, why, why isn't it a circular orbit? Well, the main reason for that is this. If you, if you have a perfect circle, there's only one tangential velocity that will produce a perfect circle. And it's very hard in nature, or even when you're making a satellite, to match that exactly. Extremely hard, because there's only one velocity that you, that you will have a perfect circle for. All right, if you have less than that velocity, less than that velocity, well, you're, you're actually going to have something that just falls back to Earth if you're orbiting a satellite, for example. Or if you have a planet going around the Sun and it has less than the velocity required for a circular orbit, it's just going to fall into the Sun. But what happens in nature and with satellites is that they have a little bit more velocity than is required for a circular orbit, and so that circular orbit becomes an ellipse instead. Here's the classwork. Please write these numbers down. Um, take into account, please, what I have written here for numbers 62 and 63. Those are little bits of information that you need for the problems.
Uh, as usual, we will, or this will be posted in a worksheet, and um, I'll also be posting the solutions videos later. See you in class.